Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. That big fright there just a moment ago. I had my message laying up on the front pew in front of me. When I stood up to sing, it's like, it's not there. <laughs> Where'd it go? <laughs> Here I had it laid it down beside me. I didn't see it. It was folded and laying down beside me. It's, it's the nightmare that every great... I've, I've woken up from sleep <laughs> about that dream. <laughs> Where'd my message go? It, it, it's just, it's a nightmare. So... For a minute there, you probably saw a sheer terror on my face. That was why. <laughs> so. Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to begin reading in verse 22. We're going to read down through verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Colossians chapter uh, 3, beginning in verse 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of the heart, fearing God. And to whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. For knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of your inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you shall also, that you also have a master in heaven. Listen to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for this day you've given. I thank you once again for the opportunity we have to take a look at your word. I pray you be with us as we continue to study. Help us, Lord, to see what it is you want us to apply to our lives today. I pray you be with us in the last time. Lord, I pray if there's one here who does not know you as their Savior, that before they would leave this place today, they would come to know you. Lord, I pray also for each one that's here, Lord, you prepare. Help us to have our hearts prepared, Lord, to receive your word. Help us to have the sins confessed. Have our hearts in tune with you so we can receive a blessing from the Lord. I pray for the blessing that's done. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. The last few weeks, now I was not here last week, but in the previous weeks before that, we have begun, have been reading down and studying through Colossians chapter 3. Just to kind of catch you up on the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians, he starts off as Paul always starts off his letters with doctrinal issues, dealing with doctrinal things that are facing the churches. This particular church was dealing with something that is, we call it Gnosticism, but it really technically isn't Gnosticism. So I like to call it pre-Gnostic Gnosticism. Because the Gnostics technically didn't exist at that point in time, but they did shortly. But very much what they believed was what these guys were focusing in on. They believed that flesh was sinful. That, therefore, as a result of that, Christ was not flesh. Uh, he never really was a man, according to them, they say. And because of that, things that he faced, you know, things that he dealt with, we don't necessarily deal with the very same way. He was an emanation from God, and all that other stuff that goes along with that. So basically, it's, it's kind of a messed up thing. Paul took the time in chapter 1 and chapter 2 to break down and explain to them, hey, you guys are wrong. You're messed up. And eventually he began to say, okay, once we have the Word of God, we understand it, we know what we're dealing with, how does that affect our in chapter 3, very specifically, he began to talk about the things that should not be in their lives because of the fact that they had accepted Christ as their Savior. Because they had accepted Him as their Savior, there were things that had to be changed, that had to leave. And that involves, by the way, some work on our part. It is in all reality a, a fantasy. To believe that the very second we pray and accept Christ as our Savior, every problem we've ever had, every sin that we've ever got, every difficulty we have is going to all of that and be gone. Not going to happen. Not It just doesn't happen. There are things that instantly change. And there's a lot of stuff that we got to work on. And sometimes, it, well, actually always, it's a lifelong work. Every day, you get up, you got to win that battle every day. You got to get in the Word of God. You got to spend time with Him. You got to crucify the flesh every day. You got to win that battle, or if you don't, every 
day, win that battle, you will lose that battle that day. Colossians 3, he looked at the things that we believe he didn't change. Then he looked at the things that they needed to put into their life. Because there were actually some positive things he's saying, hey, you got to do this. And then in the context, he begins to deal with, look at relationships. First, he looked at relationships in the home. Now he said, well, you didn't cover that. Well, I did. If you remember, I skipped ahead several chapters and dealt with that on Father's Day. I looked at the relationship of the wife to the husband, the husband to the wife, the children to the parents, the parents to the children. That's what he's dealing with here. Because in all reality, our lives, the way the Christian life, if we live it, will affect our relationships with each other. We don't live, by the way, we don't live any part of our life totally on our, to ourselves. Unless we live on a desert island somewhere. Otherwise, other than that, we affect others. By the things we do, by the things we say, by the actions we take, we affect other people. He challenges them that allow Christ to affect your home. Allow Christ to affect the way wives relate to their husbands. Allow it to relate, affect the way husbands relate to their wives. And by the way, that does affect a lot of people. Just real quickly, I want to go back there and just read one more time. That passage that we kind of skipped over today, it says, Wives, submit that yourself unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Wives are told to submit to their husbands. That's a word that we often look at and go, oh, that's terrible. Mainly because we don't even understand what it means. It has the idea to take a proper way. To fall into line, to, foot, to take a proper position, a position that we have. In all reality, we understand we don't have any four-headed beasts, two-headed beasts. They don't live. There has to be a one-head in almost any situation. You look at every person that actually functions well, they have one head. Well, a home has to have one head, too. It's the husband. Now, that doesn't mean the husband's a dictator. It doesn't mean he's a despot. It doesn't mean he's a, well, if he is, it means he's a fool. Because in all reality, being a despot and being a dictator is not what God has called us to. God has called us to live in love with our own wives. It's the very next verse. He says, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Love your wife, agape. That's the word. Self-sacrificing love gives of itself. Even if it gets nothing in return. If, in fact, husbands, we have that kind of love, it'll mean several things. It'll mean, number one, we won't be looking at other women. Whether on the internet or down in the local town somewhere. It'll mean we won't be cheating on our wives because we love our wives. It means we won't, we won't be treating them like, you know, some kind of slave. Well, in fact, treat them like the gift that God has given us. A lot. It says, children, parents are to, children are to obey their parents. Parents are to not provoke their children. But then he deals, he begins in this next context. And by the way, it is instilled in the context of the home. Because back then, when it talked about servants, these servants were within the home. Now, we don't have that kind of situation nowadays. Ancient historians test, tell us and estimate that there were 60 million slaves in Rome, in the Roman Empire, or approximately half of the population were slaves. Because of this, the work was considered below the dignity of the slave owners, Roman freemen, practically everything was done by slaves, even doctoring and teaching. They literally did nothing, which, by the way, is part of the reason why the Roman Empire fell. <coughs> And that's actually been listed by Edward Gibbons in the rise and fall of the Roman Empire as to one of the reasons why they fell, because men were, men were so looking into pleasure, so into doing nothing, that they really didn't pay attention to really much of what they did. Ancient tradition from the days of Aristotle classified slaves as things, living tools. Varro, who was a Roman, 
classified farm implements in three classes. The articulate, the inarticulate, and the mute. Now, I don't know what falls into all of those categories. <coughs> the articulate was referring to slaves. They were a farm implement, he said. Gaius, who was a Roman lawyer, said, we may note that it is universally accepted that the master per, uh, possesses the power of life and death over a slave. If a slave would run away, they were, they were branded on their forehead with the letter F, which stood for fugitive. Sometimes they were put to death with no trial at all. Paul wasn't telling slaves to revolt, though. But the principles that he would teach eventually did change society. Because what he told them is he said, Masters, treat your servants as equals. That was ultimately going to change society. He was writing here in the book of Colossians. Eventually, there's another book, by the way, that is a twin of the book of Colossians. And that's the book of Philemon. Probably going to jump into Philemon for one week once we're done with Colossians. Philemon is very short. And what Philemon is, is that when Paul, the Apostle Paul was doing what he would do, was doing, he was under arrest, he met up with someone. He met up with a fugitive slave. A fugitive slave from Colossae. They got to say it. And Paul wrote a letter and sent it with that fugitive slave back to his owner and said to him, you need to treat him as an evil, which was ultimately going to change. See, in our day, slavery is not really, it's not, it doesn't exist really, or at least it's not supposed to. I mean, some other parts of the world it does, it doesn't really exist here. But it would roughly compare to the idea of, a, of an employer and an employee relationship, and therefore what we're going to look at, and we're going to apply the truths that we see here today to the whole situation of the employer and employee. employee. I think these truths apply to us because we live out our lives we live out the Word of God. We're supposed to live it out everywhere we are and in whatever we do. We spend approximately one-third of our time at work. So in all reality, we need to live Christ in the workplace. We need to live for Christ everywhere we are. See, there is not a place where Christianity should be cashed in and hung up on the, hung up on the uh, coat rack and left home. You see, we really don't punch the clock, at least we're not supposed to. Sometimes we kind of do. We punch the clock, go to church on Sunday, got to put on my Christian clothes, got to look my Christian life. And I don't mean by Christian clothes a suit. I mean we put on our, I'm going to act like a Christian thing. It's not the way it's supposed to be. God wants us to live like Christians every day. He wants us to live out our Christianity wherever we are and whatever we do. My challenge to you is we need to live Christ in the workplace. I want to look first of all at the fact that the employee must live Christ in the workplace. How can we do that? I think there's two ways. Go with me to verse 22. He says, servants obey in all things your master according to the flesh. Not with eye services, men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. <coughs> and what he's telling us first of all, <clears throat> Christian employees must obey. He says, in all things obey those who are your masters on the earth. The principle of authority and submission is central to this entire section. That there is authority that God has given, there's submission that takes place within that authority, and that applies to the workplace. Your boss is no better a person than you are. But you still gotta listen to him. Your boss may think he is, but he's no more important than you are. But you still need to listen to him. See, obedience must be comprehensive. He says here in this verse, he says, The servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. The reference is to both the enjoyable and the distasteful duties. There are things we're called on to do in work, in our work situations. There's things we're called on to do in our life that are very distasteful jobs. I can think of a number of very distasteful jobs I've done over the years. <laughs> I was wondering whether I should list them all. Yeah. But I'm not going to list them all, but I will tell you some. 
problem that I've done, I've sho shoveled out outhouses. I've done, I've done the pumping out, I've, I've done the cl unclogging sewer drains. You get it up to about here. Not fun. <laughs> Not fun. Those are very distasteful jobs. And when I was asked to do some of those jobs, didn't really like it. But we're supposed to obey in all things. If it's something we're supposed to do, let's go out and do it. Sometimes, by the way, those jobs were done ones I had to do not because I was working, but because it was something happened. The sewer drains were more at home than anywhere else, but still not working. See, obedience must be comprehensive. It also must be consistent. Look what he says here in this verse. He says, servants obey in all things your master according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. You know what that idea means? Obey um, not with eye service as men pleasers. It's the idea of obey whether they're watching you or not. When I was in school, I remember we had gym class. And a couple times, you know, we, I guess we did something to make the gym teacher mad at us. And so he decided that one day we were going to do calisthenics the entire class period. So he starts us doing push-ups, you know. And then he walks away, or he starts walking around the room. So he, it was funny, because you could watch, it was like a wave. Wherever he was watching, the people were doing, and as he turned his back on a group, <laughs> they were doing it, and they stopped it, because they were only doing it, because he was watching. It was eye service as men please. I used to work in a place called Delaware Metals. Delaware Metals was a rather interesting job. There's a lot of illustrations I can give you from that place because it was a nightmare. But it was. But one place, one thing that wasn't uh, true to the truth about that place, um, most of the people that worked there only worked when they knew the boss was around. Well, the problem was the boss smoked a pipe with cherry tobacco. So guess what you know? What do you know about cherry tobacco? You can smell it. You knew he was coming five minutes before he got there. Because he never came out of the office without a pipe in his hand. So it, it was funny because I, I didn't realize what was going on when I first started working there. I was working there in the summer. I was doing so I was working in the shipping and receiving department. I'm packing boxes and doing all kinds of stuff. And, and half the rest of the people I could see them over there now. You know, the, the rest, one guy's taking a nap of the desk, you know. And I, I didn't, I thought, well, I don't know what they're supposed to do. I'm only there for a couple days. I didn't know what was going on. But I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do because I got a job, and so I'm working on the job. Next thing you know, a few minutes later, I see everybody's up. And they're working their guts up. And one guy comes over and yanks the stuff out of my hand. Give me that. Like, what is going on? They're all there's boss. <laughs> they were serving with eye service as men pleasers. They weren't doing it because of what they did, the fact they needed to do it. They weren't doing it to glorify God. They were doing it just because some of them were watching. That means no half done jobs. That means, well, you don't sweep the dirt under the rug. We don't take extended breaks. You know, we don't do the things that we shouldn't be doing just because, oh, well, there's nobody watching. Nobody knows. Nobody cares. See, obedience must be comprehensive in all things. It must be consistent, not as I service as men pleaders. Obedience is prompted by the fear of the Lord. Look what it says there in verse 22. Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with I service as men pleasers, but in singles of heart, fearing God. We hold God and his will in high regard. It's a motivation for service. It's a motivation for doing what God would want us to do because God wants us to do it. Go with me just for a moment. Book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. I, not chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 6. First one. It says, Let as many as servants as are under the yoke, count their own master worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. He says, We need to treat now again, when I, when I see master, you know, I understand the context. I understand it's really talking about more the idea of slaves. 
but we're applying it to the whole issue of employer employee. He says, we don't treat our employers right. We're giving them a reason to blaspheme God. We need to be the kind of testimony that God wants to be. We need to live our Christianity in the workplace. We need to be the one worker that our boss doesn't have to worry about whether they're going to steal something from them. We need to be that one worker that our boss doesn't have to wonder whether, whether, whether or not if he happens to have to take a sick day, they're still going to do something and not sit around and do nothing. We need to be a good testimony. We need to be the kind of person, we need to be the kind of employee, be the kind of Christian. See, a Christian employee must obey. A Christian employee also, according to this, he says, must be enthusiastic. Look at verse 23. Whatsoever you do, do it, in, uh, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. He says, do it heartily. He says, the idea is putting our whole being into it. See, enthusiasm should lead to productivity. See, if every Christian employee today served their employer that way, there would be a drastic increase in, in the productive, uh, in production. We should be, in all reality, the best workers. We should be a good testimony. Enthusiasm should lead to productivity. Enthusiasm should be motivated by the Lord. Look what he says here in this passage once again. Verse uh, 23. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. They all, in all reality, we are not serving man at all. We're serving God. We try to often make differentiations between what we do. But God doesn't do that. He makes our work at job and our service for Him, He puts them on the same level. As one... Uh, one preacher of old, some of, some of you may or may not have ever heard of him, Richard Clearwaters. Richard Clearwaters was the president of Fourth Baptist Church in Minneapolis, was, which was the church that eventually Calvary Seminary came from that. It was the professors from uh, Central Baptist Seminary that ended up coming to Lansdale to start uh, Calvary Seminary, which ultimately changed, uh, trained your previous pastor and myself. <coughs> Richard Clearwaters made a statement one time. He said, all level, all ground is holy ground. And every bush is a burning bush. He said, in the Christian life, there is no holy and unholy. That every part of our life is supposed to be holy unto God. It's all service to Him. Whatever we do, we're to do it with the Lord. In our workplace, if you're retired, your service for God in whatever service you do, do it as to the Lord and not unto men. Whatever position we find ourselves in in life, everything we do, we do it for God. That'll change a whole lot of stuff, by the way. It'll change the way we view. In all reality, even going to church. Oh, I'm going to sit in church today. It's going to be hot there. But turn me up to the Dumb preacher will preach past full book. I know it. I'm going to sneak in and maybe sneak out before he knows I'm there. Don't want to talk to him. You don't come here for me. You don't come here for the person you sit next to. You come here for the Lord. He's the one you're here for. And ultimately, by the way, that does affect the fact that you're supposed to be here for the other person too. By the way, we're told, he says, not forsaking the assembling ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, he says, as you're called today. By the way, how do you exhort? You don't talk to the guy sitting next to you. Exhorting has the idea of encouraging. We need to encourage one another. It is my job. It is your job. It is each of our jobs 
to encourage the people with us and around us, behind us, in front of us, encourage them in their Christian life. It really, truly is our job. So you're right, preacher, it is your job. About time to start realizing what your job is. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not just me. You too. Huh. All of us. It's our job. Encourage one another. Christian life. <laughs> the motivation here in this passage for why you should serve with, you know, not with life services and men pleasers. Not in verse 24. It says, Knowing of the Lord, you shall receive the reward of your inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. The motivation of this is the motivation of reward. He says, Earthly bosses may not give us what we deserve, but God will. Let's state every one of us has had, or knows of, or knows someone else who had. One of those nightmare bosses. You know, one that you can't please. It doesn't matter what you do. They don't like you. They don't, they, they don't, they don't care. They're just rotten people. I remember <coughs> uh, one of the bosses I had when I worked at Coca-Cola in Pottsville. They had wanted me to move up to the position of a salesman for a long, long time, and I kept telling them no. It's because I knew I had to work in conjunction with this one particular boss. He did not like me. He didn't like me. He tried to fire me when he first came. Reason? Because I was a preacher, and I only worked part-time. He thought that there was no reason to have a preacher who only worked part-time the only reason I stayed is because somebody else still got said, hey, you've got to keep this guy. He's the guy who trains the other workers. I was training all the pack out guys. I was the trainer. And he said, we've got to keep him. Uh, otherwise, i got to do <clears throat> So I, I, they were trying to move me up, and I eventually did it. My motivation for not wanting to for many, many years was that I had to work with this guy. It wasn't terrible. I'd like to tell you that working with him made it easier. But I didn't. He was just as unbearable. Now, I eventually did learn how to deal with him. I just had to recognize and understand that you were always wrong. And even if you were right, you were wrong. So it just got to the point where I just, whenever he would say that I did something wrong, instead of trying to show why what I did was actually the right thing to do, I would just tell him, you're right, I was wrong. Sorry. He didn't know how to deal with that. It got to the point where he eventually stopped saying stuff like that to me because I just kind of stopped. I, you're right. I, I messed up. Sorry. And then I, I'd see him just go. He didn't know what to do. He wanted to fight. And if you didn't get to fight, he was okay. Sometimes our bosses won't give us what we deserve. But the reminder here is in reality we're serving Christ. Even our nothing jobs that we have are, in fact, serving Christ. Digging ditches is serving Christ. Swabbing out toilets, if we do it with the right attitude and in the right way, is serving Christ. Nothing jobs become noble when they're done for God. Now, that does not mean, by the way, that everything is going to turn out well. It may be that you've lost your work and for it may be still unbearable. You may eventually have to look for another job where the loss is not so unbearable. That's not, I'm not saying it won't be the case. But we need to recognize the fact that even that the job we're doing is not for him. We're not serving him. We're serving God. <clears throat> so unbearable situations are bearable understanding we're serving God more. It's not a call to work, you know, workaholicism or whatever. It's not a call to overworking, but it's a call to understanding that we should be the kind of worker God wants us to be. We should do our best to glorify God in all that we do. As I said before, for a Christian, all around us, and every bush is a bush. 
See, the motivation is reward. The motivation is also recompense. But he says there's, there's no going to be there's going to be no uh, deed unrecompensed. Look, look at unrecompensed. Look at verse four, uh, twenty-four. Knowing that the Lord shall receive the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. For he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. So there's not going to be any deed unrecompensed. It's guaranteed. God says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 to 9, if you're there, you can turn over with me to Galatians 6. It's the law of sowing and reaping. You've seen it before. I've read it to you before. But we'll look at it one more time. Galatians 6, 7 through 9. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth the flesh, shall the flesh reap corruption. For he that soweth the spirit, shall the spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season you will reap if you faint not. It's the law of sowing and reaping. God says, if I sow, I will reap. It's that way with our you know, farming. If you sow, you will reap. Unless there's unforeseen issues that totally wipe out your crops, like hailstorms, <laughs> or other things, lack of rain, things like that. But normally, if you're going to reap, you have to sow. God says, don't be deceived. You can't mock me. You can't circumvent what I'm doing. Whenever I read that verse, I always think of playing the game. When you were a kid, then you never did this. You know, the whole miss me, miss me, now you got to kiss me thing. You never You're kidding. <laughs> but that's that's the idea there in all reality what he's saying is you can't mock God the idea of to mock is actually the word means to cause someone to miss them to, to be able to circumvent them and actually then be able to turn and mock them because they missed you God says I'm not going to miss you what you sow you will reap and you, don't be surprised you sow this thing, you will reap this thing. It's just the way it is. So in all reality, if we want good in our life, we need to sow good. If we want to see good results, we need to have good seed. We need to sow good seed. And the same, by the way, applies to the whole idea of, of even dealing with souls. We're going to see people get saved. We need to sow the Word of God. We don't get the Word of God out. Why are we surprised when people don't get saved? Well, they should knock on the door and want to come in here and get saved. That doesn't very often happen. There are ones at strange occurrences. Revivals that have happened across the nations where people have you know, pounded on church doors to get in. Yeah, there was that, you know, back when uh, uh, Spurgeon preached in his church in, in London, Spurgeon would once a month tell people not to come to church. So the visitors who couldn't get in could get in. That's a strange occurrence. That doesn't happen very often. Now, if we want to see people get saved, we need to tell them. You want to see them come to church? Invite them. You want to see them possibly, you know, come to know the Lord? Spend a little effort giving them the word of God and living Christian life in front of them. Why are we surprised when we don't live out the Christian life if somebody doesn't want to listen to what we say? Because they don't see any difference. We need to live out the Christian life. So he tells us that Christian employees should live Christ in the workplace. So you're here. Whether you're work, you know, even if you're, by the way, retired, whatever you do, we do it to the glory of God. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. There are some of you who are retired, there are a few of you who are disabled, you know, can't work because of one thing or the other. <coughs> this doesn't exclude you. It very much includes you. So whatever you do in your life, do it to God's glory and do it heartily for the Lord and not for men. Because God is 
the one we ultimately serve. He is the one we try to please. He's the one who's going to someday look at us and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or may say to us, you missed the boat. You had opportunities. That just skipped. We're told in the Bible to buy up the opportunities. I can't think of the English, the actually English verse of what it says, but that's actually true. I'll think of it in a minute. But the, the actual meaning is to buy up the opportunities. Yeah, redeeming the time. There we go. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. The idea being, why have the opportunities? The time is short. Thank you. <laughs> That's the idea there. He says we need to use the opportunities God has given us because the time we have is short. Now we can see the Christian employees must live Christ in the workplace. Real quickly, Christian employers must live Christ in the workplace too. See, under Roman law, slaves had no rights at all. But Paul looks at this whole situation and he says, hey, by the way, we're changing things. He says, first of all, Christian employees must, employers must be just. Look at verse, um, let me get back to Galatians 4, verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. Knowing that he, should, that he also have a master in heaven. The idea of being just is keep your part of the bargain. Don't ask them to do wrong. Pay them fairly. Don't ask them to put them to you over God. They need to be just. Christian employers need to be just. Now, often our employers in life are not Christians. And I understand that. And often our, often our employers will not be just and equal. But if you're here and you're a Christian, you are an employer, you need to be just and equal. Not only do they need to be, uh, show uh, justice, he says Christian employers must show fairness. The idea is equality. Equal. Look at verse 11 of chapter 3. It says there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, notice, bond, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. What he's saying is, slaves and masters are spiritually equal. Spiritually, you are equal with the other person. They were to be treated each as equal. They were to deal with each other as equal. They were to be viewed as equal. They were, in fact, equal. This, by the way, is the verse, and this is the idea that would actually eventually put the death knell in the whole idea of slavery. Because that was what was missing. Paul never got up and preached. You know, slavery sin. What did he say? Masters, treat your slaves like equals. Totally changed the way things were viewed. And <laughs> when the apostle, the apostle Paul would eventually write that letter and send it with that slave in the book of Philemon, that's exactly what he said. He said, he went away unprofitable. He comes back as a brother. He's now in the He's a friend. See, a Christian employee must, uh, employers must show fairness. Christian employers must remember that they serve the same master. Look at verse, uh, once again, verse 1. For ye also have a master. In heaven. And because of that, he will be rewarded. As in verse 24, is talked about the fact that they're going to receive a reward for what they've done. And in verse 25, they're going to be recompensed for what they've done. We will be treated equal. We need to remember that we serve the same things. Go with me just for a moment to Romans chapter 12. In Romans, the book of Romans, there's a couple of verses I want to look at real quick. He says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. 
God said he was going to recompense. He says, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay. You know, there are often times when people do things against us, whether by what they say, pick on us, whatever, or by what they do. They may do some terrible things to us. There are times that happens. God says, hey, stop. He says, do not avenge yourself. Let me do it. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Let me take care of it. He says, God says he's going to recompense. Go with me one more time to Romans chapter 14, verse 12. One more verse. He says, I shall start in verse, uh, verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the Lord, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. I think what he's saying is very similar in Colossians is what he's saying here. We ultimately will give account to God for what we do. We need to live in light of the fact that we're not serving them. We're serving God. Christian employees need to work to live Christ out in the workplace. Christian employers need to live Christ out in the workplace. What's he saying? He's saying Christianity doesn't just happen here. It's out there. It affects the whole world. It affects everything I do. It affects the way I treat my wife. It should affect the way I treat my children. It should affect the way I deal with my servants, if I have servants, or my master, if I have a master. It affects the way we live. You know, maybe you're here today and there's never been a time to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We're talking here about Christian employees and Christian employers, and you're here and you say, oh, there's never been a time I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You're talking about it. I go to church. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> Couldn't be farther from what I'm talking about. So the fact of the matter is, Jesus. Sunday school, we've been talking about Jesus coming to earth, the incarnation. He came because of people like you and people like me. People who think that they can get to heaven by being good. You know what? As a kid, I went to a church. Not often, by the way. I, 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 we, I always say I was a C and E Christian. Christmas and Easter. We went, and I should be in every other c &E Christian. We went like every other Christmas and Easter. We very rarely went. I probably count the number of times growing up on one hand that we actually went to church. It wasn't that my parents were you know, terrible people or immoral. I just didn't go to church. But I still somehow viewed my way to get to heaven by being good. And if I, as long as I was good, as long as I did you know, good stuff, that up in heaven, that great big balanced beam scale would have, you know, more good on the one side and bad on the other, and it tilt my foot. I don't know where I got that idea. It's not way to be doing God says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for the grace you sake through faith, but not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You don't get to heaven by being good. You cannot be good enough to get there. God says each one of us is a sinner. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Now, word literally means to fall short of the mark. It's kind of like a, a picture, it's a picture, I think, of, of shooting an arrow at a target. And I've told you before of my, you know, not very good exploits with the arrows. I used to be really bad. I've gotten better, by the way. I really have. <laughs> I've done some practicing. I was going to go archery hunting, but I didn't get enough practicing in to get that done. I don't think I'll get enough done before then. But bottom line is, I, I've gotten better. 
Used to be the arrow would fall off the end of the bow. It was terrible. I missed the mark. But if somebody else shot and didn't hit the bulls, I think missed it too. God says we've all missed the mark of the glory of God. Whether you're a drunkard or a murderer or just a person who goes to church and has never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, each one of us is a sinner. And God says because of our sin, we're going to hold them God. The Bible says the soul that sinneth, it shall not. In Romans chapter 6, he says, The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you're here today and there's never been a time you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, if you don't know for sure if you would die right now or you'd spend eternity, Jesus died for you so that you could have eternal life. I want to challenge you today. You need to come to Christ. Come to Him. He's always ready. He's always willing. He's always listening. Guess what? That's the cool thing. He can convict me. He can convict you. He can talk to you. He can talk to me. And he can listen to us. I want to challenge you. We're going to look to the Lord in prayer in just a second. You're going to be in the Lord's Does he need you have in your life?